This is kind of like an open source speech. It's called the rules of repair, but this is information that's been passed down to me throughout my 20 years of being a biomed and then even further back because I used to fix photocopiers, electronics, and cars. You know, I, I guess I just couldn't figure out what I wanted to do with my life, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's careers past. But I had really good mentors. And unfortunately, some of those mentors are no longer here today, but their knowledge still continues. And this is all gonna be part of it. So with that, I'll bring you guys the rules of repair. So unlike most rules, um, we are gonna start with rule number one, because usually people start at the lowest and work your way up. But we're gonna start with rule number one because it's the one rule that can get you killed. Guaranteed. So rule number one, the number one rule that you gotta follow, never ever trust somebody else's troubleshooting. That's, it's almost self-explanatory, right? But it, it's not exactly what you, you think it is. Not only do you not go into a room and, and start where somebody said, they already tried this, they already tried that, they already tried this, now you tried the stuff that you think they didn't try. No, start square one, right? The KISS principle, everybody knows that, like keep it simple. Well, start with the power cord. Now I remember one time I talked with a nurse and she said it's not turned on. I asked her if it's plugged in and then she said, yeah. And I said, at both ends? And believe it or not, like it just, it, it was one of those moments where she just uh, sat there and she's like, what do you mean? I'm like, it's, it's English, like both in first two, doesn't it? So anyway, uh, I had to explain to her that, you know, power cords have two ends and the other end was not, in, it was not plugged in. And so that's just one example. But the other example is that you always want to start at ground zero because you want to verify it's safe for you. So if you go in, let's say you're going above ceiling, you're going to be working on some lights. Lights uh, depend on the lights. These ones here do not operate at 220 volts. Higher, guys. So uh, when you go in to work on something, you want to make sure it's safe for you, which means you have to verify it from square one. If somebody says they locked out a breaker, go and make sure the breaker's locked out. Furthermore, take out your multimeter and check it and make sure it's de-energized. Same thing goes with spring suspension, loads, pneumatic, steam, all the above. I mean, we all, we have some of the most uh, hazardous environments to work in out of almost any career field. Make sure it's safe for you. Now, if somebody says they locked out a breaker, you gotta make sure that they know what they're talking about, all right? Because I don't know about your definition of locked out a breaker, but it certainly does not mean put a piece of wire on there. Maybe to somebody's it does, you know? That is obviously not a locked out breaker. Wouldn't trust them. This guy probably had a very bad day. So if you take a look at that picture, you can see that he was cutting through what, what is probably a mains, I'd say 440, based on the looks. And see these cute little ribbons wrapped around there. That's phase one, phase two, and phase three. This guy might not even be alive, all right? And it would have been very simple because they have this thing called, well, they call it a fluke voltage detector, but I call it the chicken stick, and so do a lot of electricians and stuff. You can actually take the stick and not even make physical contact, and it will light up, and it shows you, hey, there's still energy here. You know, be careful. Well, this guy obviously took no precautions, and he tried hacking off uh, phase one, and I hope he's all right. You know, start at square one. If somebody told him it's de-energized, you're safe to work, he should have checked it. Simple enough. This is an interesting picture, and the more you stare at it, the more that you'll realize that it's more and more messed up. You think, all right, yes. Somebody knew what they are doing when they locked out a breaker. Then you start looking at these other ones. You're like, wow, those ones are off, and they're not locked out. I wonder what's going on with that. And then you look down here, and you see a couple of these are off. It's like, why are those off? They're not locked out. What's going on? If that's a construction zone, where are those circuits? We don't even know. And furthermore, when you see handwriting next to the breakers, I question the legend, which is, you know, what tells you what breaker goes to what. Um, it's, it's clearly uh, a mixed process when you see something like that. So I, I'm kind of like an inspection activity. When I see something wrong, I start digging, right? If you see, like, somebody locked it out, somebody knows what they're doing, kind of, but why aren't the other ones? I had an excellent talk about rule number two with somebody up in Michigan. Rule number two is Band-Aid fixes always come back. Now, there infers, what is a Band-Aid fix? 
A Band-Aid fix is a temporary fix that you make long-term, right? A Band-Aid fix is something that you do just to get it up and running, which maybe you shouldn't, right? Because there are a lot of conditions, especially in a medical facility, specifically, that we don't Band-Aid fix, all right? But because of the discussion I had with somebody, I actually had to write it down here just to key it in and just to be sure that everybody's clear. It's a temporary fix that is meant to go long term. They always come back, which means that if you do something to get it up and running, it's going to come back. It's going to break again. Maybe not in the way that you intend or that you expect. It's going to break again every time. So Band-Aid fixes entail a lot of different things. Electrical tape. Every time I see electrical tape, it sends shivers down my spine because I was electrocuted when I was a junior biomed because somebody used electrical tape. I was over in Germany and I was on top of a stainless steel freezer and there was a, an electrical issue on that guy and I was up there and I was monitoring the cables that came down behind it and draped across the top was maybe some 20 to 22 gauge, really thin gauge. You wouldn't think in America that really thin gauge wiring would have high voltage on it. Normally, in America, if you see really thin gauge wiring, you're expecting 20, 12 volts, 5 volts, something like that. I think 24 volts is usually your HVAC wiring. Anyway, this thin cable came over the top of this freezer, and then there was electrical tape wrapped around something large. I was like, what the heck is that? So I'm standing on a chair. I know, OSHA is probably in the room, right? There's no OSHA in Germany, especially when you're in a war. So I was standing on a chair, and a sergeant was behind me, and I'm grabbing on this wire and he's like, do you see it? And I said, yeah, I think I see it. So I'm grabbing onto it and it's, I'm like, hey, it's squishy. So I'm squish, squish, squish. And all of a sudden, Ugh! it locked me up. And I was locked up to a stainless steel freezer. All right. So this sergeant came over and he kicked the chair out from under me. And I went tumbling across the floor and he probably saved my life. So I didn't check to make sure that the wiring was de-energized. All right. And somebody did a Band-Aid fix. All right, in Germany, in all across Europe actually, and across a lot of the world, they use terminal blocks, which is you have a live connection here and you have a screw down terminal here and you butt connect wires that way. Well, unfortunately it creates an open terminal at the top where you screw it down, that's live. And that's what I was grabbing onto when I reached on there. So now every time I see electrical tape, it, it just scares the heck out of me. I mean, first off, we shouldn't be using electrical tape anyway. It's not sanitary. It's not a permanent fix. It falls off. It can, you know, it can contaminate an area. I've seen electrical tape in surgery. It's just, I, I've seen it in the craziest things. My team, the, they're never allowed to use electrical tape. There's always a better way of doing it. And plus, should you really be wrapping a cord with electrical tape anyway? I mean, shouldn't you be replacing the cord or something? But, Band-Aid fixes always come back. If you've seen this in the field, yeah, it got you down the road. But as soon as they start using cleaners, as soon as they start yanking the cord or something, it's going to come unraveled because the outer insulation also is part of your strain relief on a cord, especially a, a hospital grade cord. So if it's broke right here and you're exposing some of your inner conductors, well, some of that, that yank prevention is gone. That integrity is gone. The, the electrical tape is stretchy. It doesn't, doesn't solve that problem. So anyway, electrical tape, it's a Band-Aid fix. This one here, even though it shows wood and a screwdriver, believe it or not, I have seen this so often with biomeds. If you see a piece of medical equipment and a fastener comes loose, do you grab a screwdriver and tighten that fastener back down? Most people do. That's a Band-Aid fix. Why did it come loose in the first place? Fasteners that come loose, usually the threads are now compromised. Now uh, the, the vibration is probably what knocked it loose. We have Loctite, thread locker. We have locking fasteners. I mean, there's a lot of solutions to a problem that screwing it back in, it's not gonna fix anything. As you can tell, the leverage on this door, it's gonna yank it back loose. Yeah, you can probably tighten it down now, but in a week, it'll start coming loose. I guarantee you, I'll put money on it. It's a Band-Aid fix. I see it all the time when people start loosening up fasteners and, and you know, especially on surgical tables, they get loose all the time. You gotta take that fastener all the way out, put thread locker on her, and then put it all the way in and tighten it down the spec. So many people just crank it back down. Next PM cycle, it's gonna be loose again. 
guaranteed. That is a Band-Aid fix. Rule number three, ooh, this is a good one. If it happens to one, it happens to more. Now you really have to think about it, and I purposely chose this picture because it shows a caster. God, we've all replaced casters. The polymer on there, it has an expected life cycle. Polymers break down either because of the environment that they're in, because of cleaning solvents, it could be because of the floor wax. Polymers break down over a period of time. So if this one caster is breaking, what are the odds that the other ones are disintegrating as well? If it happens to one, it happens to more. So specifically for casters, you should never replace just one caster anyway. You should replace them in pairs or quads because if you just replace one, the diameter is going to be different. You know, polymers shrink and expand. It's going to have a different level of traction than the other casters. So you're going to have a cart that's maybe uncontrollable. Maybe it won't lock properly. So that's why I chose this photo specifically is because if it happens to one, happens to more, you might as well budget to replace all of them. Furthermore, if it happens to one, it happens to more. If you got one stretcher out of a batch of, let's say a hundred that you bought five, six, seven years ago, and you see the caster starting to fall apart on one of them, where are the odds that some of your other ones are going to start falling apart too? You can actually use this rule to help you budget and help sustain your medical equipment management plan because a lot of people are reactive, which means you wait till a customer puts in a work order and then when you get the work order, then you go and you solve the problem. But the fact of the matter is, if it happens to one, it's going to happen to more. So you're just going to have aggravated staff. You're going to be always chasing your tail with all these reactive work orders. So by you using this rule, you're actually changing your, your mentality. You're changing your medical equipment management plan. So by being proactive, by even keeping an extra set of casters, as soon as one fails, you got them, you're ready to go. You know it's gonna happen again. Now you can see this on many different types of equipment, not just casters. Oh, this one. This is a uh, cardiac heater cooler. Um, this is right after the OEM came through and did their PMs. This is actually the next morning. They actually approved that. Well, you know, the thing is, is if you see that, it's telling you two different things. One, it's telling you that I would never trust that OEM. Uh, two, it's telling you that your staff is not cleaning them correctly. So you have more than one issue. But therein is the thing. If it's happening to one, it's happening to more, right? So if you have staff, and that's their responsibility is to take care of these, well, they're probably not taking care of any of the other ones either. So the goal is once you notice a trend, once you see something, check other units in your fleet. You're almost guaranteed that they're also failing. Now, and here's another example. You see that this is all slime in the hoses. Um, again, staff was not sanitizing their equipment correctly. So we identified an equipment failure and a staff failure. So there's multiple things that you now have to fix. And we'll get to that in some later rules. You're going to see a lot of these rules will actually intermingle with one another. You're going to be like, hey, wait a minute, they're very related. Well, that's by design. It's because all these rules work together to create a better technician, a better maintenance program. And this isn't just for biomed. You can use these rules for any type of repair career out there. Rule number four, it was already broken. I love telling people this. Time permitting, every single repair should be treated not as a failure, but as an opportunity. Use that time wisely, if you have the time, to explore the failure and figure out why it happened in the first place. Now this one here, kind of an interesting photo when I seen it, because this type of connector right here is either for a motor or it's for like a battery, a battery charge circuit. Well, if the trace caught fire right there, going to that connector, that means either if it's a motor, your motor is frozen up, if it's seized, you know, any motor that's seized draws maximum current. It's not designed for that. You know, the back EMF should limit the amount of current in a motor. So if the motor seized up, you're going to get maximum current. You're going to fry your circuit. Now you could just change the board, but the problem is, is what happens when you change the board? Your motor's still seized up, right? So time permitting, you should use it as an opportunity, figure out why it caused it. Now, if it's a battery charge circuit, now everybody knows batteries are good for about three years. Batteries fail internally, they can short internally, so it's zero ohms, which is 
maximum. So if you have a battery charge circuit that isn't monitored correctly, it could catch the board on fire. If you don't check the batteries, whatever's connected to that terminal, somebody should be checking because it has a problem. Guaranteed. Now I do a lot of live streams and um, I do them because I like showing the process. The process of troubleshooting is something that normally in technical career fields is handled through, um, what would you call it? Hmm. A journeyman system. Journeyman system. We don't have a journeyman system. What we have is here's your work orders, right? People can't see the process. I can teach you a lot of theory, but when you get in the field, if you don't know the process from the moment you walk up to something to the aha, the epiphany where you figure out what's really going on, that is different for each and every person in this room your process for how you do what you do. Well, I show people my process. I do it on video and things do go wrong. All right. I've had where fasteners shear off mid. Yeah, I was, I was changing out um, a head on a compressor and one of the reed valves, this fastener, I thought, all right, I'm going to do 110% on this job live on the camera. And I start removing the fastener and snap live on the air. What do you do? Do you get upset? Do you have that luxury? We don't have that luxury. So years and years ago, back when, before I started uh, fixing medical equipment, I quit getting aggravated when things go really wrong. I used to get so upset back when I first started fixing things 25 years ago that I would throw my tools across the room when something really went wrong. I get that upset. But the thing is, as you learn more and more things to solve problems, that's tools in your toolbox up here. And if your toolbox is big enough, when things go awry, you don't see it as a failure, as a problem. You see it as an opportunity. Now this guy here, live on the air, uh, it had a seized up motor. Well, that seized up motor, yeah, it could happen. It's just not very normal. Come to find out, there's a little brass piece up in here. Fluid intrusion corroded it. But why did it have fluid intrusion? Hmm. That shouldn't normally happen on a compact suction unit, but unfortunately this is a staff problem. So now you have a mechanical problem and a staff problem again. So if it happens to one, it happens to more, right? If the staff aren't setting up their suction apparatus correctly on this one, they're probably doing it to other ones, right? So with the knowledge that this here is caused by a user error, we went through their other crash carts and found out that several other ones are failing. You can hear the bearings because fluid intrusion, they weren't setting it up correctly. So you're going to see how some of these rules just kind of relate to one another. But uh, yep, that's a compact suction unit done live on the air. This one here is a treadmill, also done live on the air. Um, this one's an interesting one, probably relates to a lot of you guys. This right here is the control board. You know, with treadmills, they pulse DC to a motor and that's how it controls the speed. The, the longer the pulse, the faster the motor goes. Well, there's this little component right over here called a flyback diode. And it is cooled by the aluminum that is on the side and uh, there's thermal compound in there. And what happens is as a treadmill gets older, you know, all these cycles, that thermal compound dries out. And when thermal compound dries out, you can't cool the semiconductor. And if you can't cool the semiconductor, it fails in a short and you'll pop the main boards, uh, the main board fuses. So if your AC fuses on a power supply are, are failing, it happens for a reason right? So I dug deep into this one. This is actually in my living room. Somebody is throwing out that treadmill and a little $3 flyback diode got it back up and going and some thermal compound. But with that knowledge, I went to other treadmills for my customers. And when I'm doing the PMs, cause you have to clean all that area out anyway, just take out the little Phillips screw that's holding your semiconductors to the, the heat sink and just check it. And if it's, you know, frying, then you just put a little dab of thermal compound down there, tighten it back down, you're good. But because I deep dove into this one particular unit that somebody is throwing out, I now have that knowledge that, hey, by the way, check, the, check these semiconductors. And uh, this guy here, I, I actually ended up selling online because I uh, got to fund this project somehow, you know? So <laughs> I think that guy bought me a new camera. But uh, anyway, just that knowledge of the fact that things can expire, they do have a life expectancy, and part of that is your thermal compound. That was done all live on the air because I took the time. I could have just changed out the board, but what about the other units that are in, you know, 
in my customer's inventory. I would have never known. So if you have time, explore the problem and use it as a tool in your arsenal. So this here is the inside of a NIM 3.0 Neuromonitor. Neuromonitor is a device that injects a signal on a nerve. You poke little needles on a nerve and then they'll go through with a probe and they'll hear the beeping. And that's because your nerves act like wires. So if you inject a signal at one end, you can trace it further up. So if you're doing like a dissection of the neck, they can make sure that they're not cutting nerve tissues because once you cut it, you could actually kill somebody. This is a very important device right here. Well, this device, it's, I think it's between 60 and $80,000, brand new. And hospitals don't have too many of them, you know, because it's 60 to $80,000. And this whole entire device started having problems because of this little guy right here. You have a little coin battery, a 2032 battery, but this one's a little special. It's got these legs that are in a socket. Well, this $80,000 device was taken down by a $3 battery. So when your device loses that battery, it loses its Windows time. And when Windows records files to and from a hard drive, they can start having problems when it doesn't know the time. So it's even worse on newer Windows computers. Newer ones, part of Windows security is, is that all the files have to have their time. The older ones, there's a little bit more problems. But um, anyway, that little coin cell battery there, but because I deep dove and I found that problem on this guy, I made a video and I put it out there because everybody else can be checking their fleet. I even left the, the part number in the video description where they can get that battery. Thing is, is as they get older, those batteries are going to fail. So you're going to get mysterious errors and stuff, but it's, it's because I took that extra time to figure out why is it creating this problem that now other people might be able to save their devices. Oh, rule number five is a good one. I actually took some advice on this one from uh, Mr. Robert Kale. So, if you touch it, you own it. You guys should be very well aware of that. If you touch something, every problem related to that device in the future will be blamed on you. And that's, that's kind of like a CYA thing, but it, you just have to be cognizant of that. When you go in, if you go in for, let's say, an SPO2 cable, but here the bed rail is falling off, you went into the room, just keep your eyes open. You should be able to look at everything in your vicinity and check everything before you leave. Because if you were even there, if anything goes wrong, they're going to say, well, Biomed was just here, right? They will blame it on you. So you should always check everything before you leave to make sure it's safe. And here is Robert's contribution. Remember mission creep. In the military, we call it mission creep. And that is when you start doing somebody else's job. I don't know about you guys, but almost every single biomed shop that I've seen across the country is short people. So why are we taking on stuff that we are clearly not funded for? IT is like the one that comes really to mind. So here's the thing. Let's say I have one of those little nodes that sends HL7 data off to the, the magical digital medical record in the sky. If I go in and I program that thing once, they're going to be like, oh yeah, just send it down to Justin. He knows how to do it. I'm not funded for that. It's not my job. It's somebody else's job to do that. But guess what? Path of least resistance. That's how humans operate, right? If they know I can do it, they're going to keep giving it to me to do. And it's somebody else's job. Mission creep. So if you touch it, you own it. Remember that. Yes, you might know how to do something, but just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should, right? And also, remember, uh, with mission creep, you might not be insured if you are an independent service provider to handle that problem. So I know some people like to run wiring in there. What if that building burns down? You run one piece of plumbing. What if you are not insured for water damage? And you know, water is one of the worst things for insurance companies to cover. If you do any plumbing whatsoever and you're not insured for that, you're culpable. So if you touch it, you own it. Remember that. <laughs> Rule number six. The reason I'm laughing is because I have a story about one of the guys that used to work for me. If you don't know the answer, consult another source of information. This one seems self-explanatory. I had a board on a very expensive device and the little uh, plastic guide that sits on the guide pins, it came off with the connector. And one of my texts, Mr. Dave, Dave, if you see this, I'm sorry, man. Okay. But anyway, Mr. Dave, he had this thing where he just didn't look it up. 
He just stuck it back on there and powered up the device. I told him, you know, you got a 50-50 shot, right? Like if you power that up and you didn't check the connector properly, you're going to have a problem. Well, he's like, well, I think I got it. And he flicked it on, let the magic smoke out. See, the thing is, is if he would have just paid attention just for a moment, you would have realized, let's say just the negative trace alone, you can figure out which, where it is, right? Anybody who's got a multimeter, you can check continuity between maybe one of the local screws, which is on the ground plane of a board. If it is cotton continuous with one, of the, with one of the pins, that's your negative, And you can probably figure that out on the wiring harness. But he didn't even think about it. He just plugged it in. He said, well, if it burns, it burns. Well, that cost us thousands of dollars and the surgeons were very upset. And uh, Dave, I still remember that man. So <laughs> if you don't know, consult another source of information. Now, I had a really good talk with somebody up in Michigan who does contracting. And he's got a team of people that he relies on. He's got an electrician. He's got a plumber. He does dental, believe it or not. And the interesting thing about dental is you have to deal with air pressure. You have to deal with vacuum. You've got electrical, sometimes high voltage electrical. And then you also have uh, sometimes ventilation concerns and stuff. He doesn't do all that. He has his team of people that he relies on because if he doesn't know, he's going to consult somebody that does, right? He'll just whip out his phone. He'll be like, hey, what about this over here? Can you do it? So don't do it yourself if you can't. So I consult a whole bunch of areas of information when I'm doing my job. And one of the big ones that I like using is LinkedIn. You can actually contact the person that designed the equipment themselves and they will write you back on LinkedIn. It's crazy. When in history have we had that access to personnel and information? But you can do it. Build your network. And if you don't know, just write me and say, hey, what about this? You ever see this before? I'll put it out to my network, which is a lot of people, and uh, you know, we'll get you an answer. I don't know the, all the answers. You definitely don't know all the answers. The community does. Somebody does. So if you don't know, don't, don't guess. Don't maybe hurt somebody. Let's put it out there. Now there's other ways. MedWrench. If you've ever Google searched any error code, you guaranteed one of MedWrench's little posts came up, but you might not always get an answer. That's the only downside. But the thing is, is this here is permanent. It's, I've, I've pulled up articles from 10 years ago. You know, it's for posterity reasons. So if you have extra time and you see that somebody is writing something that you've seen before, get down there and write them a little, little reply. Even if it's been solved a long time ago, still somebody else will see it because if it happens to one, it happens to more, all right? So if you see an error code or something, it's going to happen to other people. And here's the thing that I've learned by doing YouTube over the years is a lot of us think that, oh, we have manufacturers or, you know, we have a, a good supply of parts. Other countries get our medical equipment when we're done with it, right? So the fact of the matter is, is when you are done with it and you turn it in, it gets put on a boat and somebody has to keep that equipment running. So if we invest the time and energy into answering people's questions and stuff, a lot of people from other countries rely on our databases to keep their entire hospitals up and running. So that's one of the things that I've definitely learned. But MedWrench, it's, it's still going strong. Hopefully they're going to change their database soon to like an app on your phone. Guys from MedWrench, if you're watching this, I'm bringing it up again. I'll, I'll keep the pressure on because I think a MedWrench app on your phone would be awesome. But anyway, MedWrench is a good source of information. <sighs> Rule number seven. Image is everything. You have nothing else for the rest of your life but your image. That's it. You can be a doctorate, and if you have a bad image, everybody's going to know. So image is all you have. Your reputation is only as good as your last repair, which means if you do 100 repairs correctly, you are the savior of the entire facility, and then you do one half-ass job. What do you think they're going to remember? They're always going to remember the fact that you messed up that one time. And everybody makes mistakes. And I'm not saying don't make mistakes. What I'm saying is don't be the clown that paints your outlet. <laughs> you know, Everybody will remember if you mess something up. There's so much stuff wrong with this photo. But anyway, it's just really important to remember your image is all you have. And if you're a company, even if your employees that were messing up aren't there anymore, they're always going to remember. I can remember, uh, a couple years ago when I was working over here at Methodist Hospital, I heard somebody talk about Prescott's 
Prescott's microscopes, right? I've done business with them for years. I think the guys are awesome. They had one bad experience with one technician like 10 years ago. I'm like, guys, who hasn't messed up once or twice? That's not it. Remember, people remember. So always try to do your absolute best. Rule number eight. If you don't have time enough to fix it right the first time, you'll have plenty of time to fix it right the second time. Now that one there comes from my grandfather. So, and, and you know, I, I grew up a redneck on a, on a hog farm in the middle of nowhere, so. But uh, the fact of the matter is, is even we didn't do stupid stuff like that, all right? <laughs> I see like one fuse. So I had this guy that came into my gas station one time. I, I told you guys I fixed cars at one time in my life. He pulled up by one of the gas pumps and his car was on fire. But the crazy thing is, is right across the street there was a bowling alley, an old bowling alley that was decommissioned. But every single bowling alley that ever existed has a large parking lot. Yes. <laughs> Why did he pull in next to my gas pump? But there he is. He came in, he's screaming, my car's on fire. And I said, Why are you next to my gas pump? So I ran out there and I shut it down and we tried putting it out. But when we uh, subsided some of the fires, we noticed that he tried installing his own audio system without fuses. So the thing is, batteries, they just like to keep giving love until there's no more left to give. And that's exactly what happened. So even when we put out the fire, the battery still got charged. It's still going to heat up some wires. It's, it's going to reignite the fire time and time again, which is what happened. He didn't have time enough to do it right the first time. Well, now he doesn't have a car. So. But we don't have that luxury in hospitals, guys. In hospitals, you have only one opportunity to make it right. So do what you can. Rule number nine, eliminate the predictable failures because the unpredictable is still going to happen. Now, I use the serpentine belt as a perfect example because you can grab onto any serpentine belt in anybody's car and you can look and you can get a pretty good estimate of how old it is. You predict that, right? So why is it that everybody waits until they fail? Everybody waits until they fail or timing belts. Even worse, a timing belt on your car. Timing belts, they, every auto manufacturer out there has a replacement interval. They tell you about it when you buy it, but a lot of people don't. And then they end up having to buy a new engine because a lot of engines nowadays are interference engines, which means the piston comes up, smacks into the valves if they ever lose their little dance that they're doing. Predictable, right? They told you when it's going to fail or when it should be replaced. You kept driving it because why not? Well. I wrote this rule when it was during an inspection, uh, when I was in South Carolina. Everybody was running around like chickens with their heads cut off because we were getting inspected in like a week. But the thing about inspections is it's stuff that you should have been doing the whole time. So when I was thinking about it, you know, one of the things that we do is we go into like equipment rooms and we survey all the little PM stickers because every year they should be different colors. That's a low hanging fruit. Inspectors love that stuff. But why is it that I can walk into almost any hospital and you can see ones from years ago? They're just there. If you do proactive sweeps, you eliminate the predictable failures because you can see the ones that are not compliant. But the thing is, people still, still get written up for the stupid stuff. The unpredictable stuff is still going to happen. Your car is still going to get a flat tire. It doesn't mean you have to wait for the timing belt to break, you know? But that's, uh, that's one that I wrote myself because I, I always noticed that people were always being reactive when you can be proactive. Find the failures before they really become real big problems and then press on. Your work life is going to be so much more comfortable. Your coworkers' lives are going to be easier. There's a lot of things you can see if I, if I go under like a nurse's desk or something and I see a power supply wrapped incorrectly, you know it's going to happen. You can predict that. You, it, you might just have to train your staff, but you can see it. I can see it right here. It's about ready to fail on this particular one. Things always fail where the soft part meets the rigid part. That's on every device. That's on everything, really. But if you can predict it, walk around, do your sweeps, be proactive. Now, I have this thing when I have teams. I'll assign them an area. So let's say pack you pre-op, something like that. I'll assign somebody to that area. And then I will go through part of my rounding as a team leader and I will ask them, who's your biomed? They should know. 
they should know your name. They should know your face. If they don't know, that means my biomed is not doing his rounding correctly because if you stop by even once per week, they're going to know who you are. If they don't know, that's part of the problem. He's not being proactive. It's obvious. What about those central monitoring stations? You guys, we've all had this problem. You have PMs on central monitoring stations for a reason. Computers get hot. And when they get hot, they throw tamper, temper tantrums. And it's predictable. You have PMs. You know that you have to clean it. If you don't clean it, they get hot. They fail. It's predictable. We know that. Why is it that they're still dirty? It still happens everywhere. It's predictable. Eliminate the predictable because the unpredictable is still going to happen. You're still going to have the construction crew that comes through and cuts your network lines. You're still going to have the network switch that, you know, falls off the rack because reasons. I mean, it's predictable. Eliminate the predictable failures. Rule number 10. This is a really big one. Sometimes the only thing that's broke is the user. Ooh, I know that's setting some fires. Nobody likes talking about user errors, but user errors accompany 80 to 90% of all repair work orders. I mean, you have to think about it. Even user abuse is a user error. They're not using the equipment correctly. If they're using the wrong cleaning solvent, if they throw the item across the room, that's all user abuse. Sometimes all you can do is change out the user or teach them because teaching people is part of our job. We fix people too. I tell my staff members that all the time. We fix people too. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to admonish them when they're doing something wrong. It also means, did you document it correctly? Did you notify their leadership that, hey, you guys are doing something wrong? And also remember, these rules relate to one another. If they're damaging that equipment, maybe it's happening in other units, right? If it happens to one, it's happening to more. You see how these rules kind of intermingle. Try to fix the user to prevent future damage. This would slash most of our work responsibility because we are chasing our tails as a career field because of users abusing their equipment, not doing the right thing. But did you do the right thing? Did you document it correctly? And did you offer training to them when they were clearly not using the equipment correctly? It goes both ways. Rule number 11, this is a new one. I had a senior technician up in Michigan, so if you see this, this is your rule, I got you. Communication is key. Communication is key. If you do an awesome repair on a piece of equipment, but your communication is horrible, what do you think they're gonna remember? You think it's gonna matter that their machine's up and running if they don't even know it's fixed yet? Think about it. Emails, phone calls, statement of work. Statement of work is the gospel. If I come into your facility, what's on the statement of work is all I'm supposed to do. If I go above that, remember, if you touch it, you own it. I could be culpable for that. I only agree to what's on the statement of work. But if the statement of work is also vague, if people don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing, that's also bad, right? You're in briefing. When you show up on a site, you tell them what you're going to do, the equipment you're going to need, the times you're going to need the room. That's all part of your in-processing. When you, when you get to a new facility or when you go to a customer's account, you show up, you tell them what you're going to do, how long it's going to take. That's all part of your communication. If they don't know how long you're going to be there, and then five minutes later, they're like, hey, what are you doing in this room? That's part of your communication. You're out briefing. Huge, important one that people fail. When you fix a piece of equipment, do you tell your users? Do you tell them that, hey, I might need extra parts, or hey, this could be happening on other devices? Your out briefing is such a vital piece of communication for biomeds. And a lot of people fail on the out brief. They just want to fix it and get the heck out of the room. Out briefing is huge. Your follow up. Follow up includes the salespeople. So after you fix it, the salespeople should be going through and saying, hey, is there anything else we can do for you? Because I know if we fix that one, maybe it's happening on your other ones too. It happens one, it's happening to more, right? Follow up is a huge part of it. Maybe next time you visit an account or a department, be like, hey, remember I came in last week to fix this? Everything going all right? That communication is absolutely key to establishing rapport between your customer and you. Training, offering interpersonal training, it's a huge part. If they're doing something wrong, you can offer training. If they get a new piece of equipment, you offer training. You see how this works. It's huge. And doing quotes. That's a piece that I really didn't understand until I started doing third party. 
the coating process is so absolutely vital to make sure that everything is clearly outlined and everybody understands what's about to happen. If that is successful, the repair could be a complete failure. And if everybody's clearly updated on the communication, it's good. People will accept the fact that a failure happened. Communication is key. That was a good one for the guys up in Michigan that suggested that. Rule number 12 is the culmination of all of them. Failures are a symptom. A good technician will find the cause of a failure. A lot of people change out the broken part. Why did it break? Is it because your PMs are not frequent enough? Is it because your users are abusing your equipment? Are they using the wrong cleaning solvent? Is it because the motor is failing? Is it because that this is a, you know, a commercial environment and they're using uh, a consumer grade product? There's a lot of reasons behind something. Is it because they're using the wrong consumable? There's always a failure being just a symptom. There's a real cause to every single problem out there. Maybe the cause is something simple like the user. Maybe the cause is a faulty product, but always invest the time to figure out why it happened in the first place. A failure is just a symptom. Any questions? All right, guys. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.